when it comes down to building soil, one of the best things you can do is create compost. Compost is a organic matter mix. So you have sand, you have clay, you have rock, and then you have organic matter. All these things create soil. Every single one of them creates soil. And every single one of them is a component of soil. Now, organic matter is really beneficial because that's where you're going to get a lot of the nutrients, the bacteria and other microbes like fungi and nematodes that your plants need to thrive. It is also a great way to make use of waste you have from your kitchen, your garden, or from your lawn. Now, there's a lot of ways to make compost. There's everything from vermicomposting, which is where you have worm bins and the worms do all the work for you and use their castings or poop. There is hot rock compost or thermophilic compost that is a very bacteria dominant compost and there is cold rot compost that is a very fungal dominant compost. Both are needed and, and that's something I want to make very clear. There's no one perfect way that is going to be the end all be all best. I like to use a lot of thermophilic compost because I have a lot of waste and therefore I can get a lot of hot compost made up and it breaks down faster so I can use it sooner. Cold rot compost is the exact same thing, the exact same build but you're going to leave it alone. You're not going to be turning it. You're not going to be adding things to it. You're not going to be trying to mix it up and try to make it get really, really hot. You're just leaving it alone and letting it slowly break down through fungal, uh, fungal digestion. So with all that said and done, we're going to start adding our carbon. In this case, our carbon is a bunch of aspen wood shavings that was bedding for my baby ducks. So there's a little bit of their poop in here, a little bit of their water, a little bit of their food, a little bit of straw when we ran out of wood shavings one day. And this is going to be our base to start the compost. Carbon is anything that's been dead for a while. So straw, leaf litter, uh, wood shavings, wood chips, that's your carbon. You can also throw charcoal in here. What carbon does is A, it breaks down slower while it also absorbs those nutrients and becomes a holding and waste station for those nutrients from the other green matter in the compost. But it also absorbs the smell. So when you're making a lot of compost that could be really stinky, you want a lot of carbon in it to absorb that odor so that you don't smell it, your neighbors don't smell it, and the animals in the neighborhood don't smell it. So I'm gonna put a base down of this into my bin. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some kitchen scraps. Now your kitchen scraps, they can be everything from old stale bread, moldy cheese, whatever you're looking for. One thing I would recommend to throw in here is anything that's already microactive. So if you have things like sauerkraut that you need to throw because it's gotten too mushy, if you have an old scuzzy beer that's been in the fridge a little too long, things like that that have things like yeast, lactoactive bacteria, things like that are great to throw in here at the beginning to give it a kind of a jump start, to kind of kick it all off. So my kitchen scraps go in. There's a lot of liquid in here, which is another reason to have the carbon. I see some coffee grinds, banana peel, a bunch of stuff in there. And then again, I spread it out because I don't want it all just concentrated in one spot. I want to have it all over the place. And that's a good stinky mess already. Now I throw in another layer of wood shavings or carbon. And we're already out of green matter. Like I only had the one bin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some quick weeding. I have a bunch of burdock leaves here and I got these uh, West Indy gherkins and wild grapes getting all over my compost bin. I might as well use them because they're here. So I'm going to grab some of these burdock leaves first. This could be comfrey. This could be just weeds from the garden. Whatever you got available, just leafy green material. We left these burdocks here specifically for this reason. And now that we have them all cut up, those plants are going to die and their long tap roots are going to rot and become more organic matter down in the clay. So I can take all this and I can just throw it in or I can take a machete, a leaf, uh, leaf mulcher if you've got a... a a wood chipper of any kind, things like that. You can chop this up finer. I'm just gonna to toss it in and just give it light wax with the machete, just to break it up a little bit so it can break down faster and be food for the microorganisms faster. Now, one important tool that I recommend everybody have for their compost is a compost thermometer. They're inexpensive, they're usually under $20. And what they're gonna do for you is they're gonna tell you whether you're under temperature, at the right temperature, or over the right temperature. All those are important to know. If you are between 145 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit, you're right on the money. That's going to be nice and hot. It's going to be cooking really fast, and you're going to be able to get a lot of things happening quickly in the compost. If it's under 130 degrees Fahrenheit, it's just not hot enough to have that work. It's going to take a long time. And if it gets above 180 degrees Fahrenheit, you're in trouble. 
you've got a lot of problems happening because all that nitrogen that you're trying to produce is going to start to vaporize off in the form of ammonia. So that means you need more carbon in the compost, first of all, but it also means that you need to get it wet more often. You've got to turn it more often. When you have animals like these ducks and geese behind me, these birds are producing manure, approximately two and a half pounds of manure a day from all these birds combined. All that's going into their bedding in their coop, going onto the ground around their pen. I can get at least a portion of that manure mixed into my compost and it's gonna be very high in nitrogen, rich in potassium, rich in phosphorus, and many trace minerals and other vitamins and uh, micronutrients that our plants need so that we can receive them later. If you've got a friend that's got a stable, they're always trying to get rid of their manure. You can always make use of it, just compost it if you're too worried about putting it directly on the garden. I never recommend putting manure directly on your plants. It's a good thing to throw into the garden at the end of the season to kind of recharge the soil for next year, but it's not something I would put on during the growing season. I highly recommend instead just composting it. So an ancient way of making fertile soil from infertile soil is something called terra preta. Terra preta is an ancient Amazonian technique that was used in the Amazon rain basin because the soils there are very dense in clay and sand, very little organic humus or organic matter of any kind. And because of the heavy rain seasons, it washes away a lot of the nutrients that could be left in there from the jungle canopy falling its leaves on the ground. And so the indigenous peoples of the Amazon realized that they dug trenches and pits throughout their whole gardens and filled that with something called charcoal and a bunch of other organic matter, they could do something really, really special and almost magical. And that is growing plants where they shouldn't be able to grow. In the form of terra preta, 20% of the soil is gonna be approximately charcoal. Porosity of the charcoal allows it to absorb a lot of nutrients and become a holding ground for bacteria, nematodes, fungi, and many other microorganisms. So that's the first step. You fill it with as much charcoal as you can get in there. And then after that, you throw in everything you can think of that's rotting. But there's another thing that goes in, and that is pot shirts. Pot shirts are ceramic pottery that has been broken into pieces. And this is gonna, again, harbor good bacteria, be a staging ground for them, but also all those little air pockets in the pottery when it's broken up become holding ground for oxygen, which means that the ground stays semi-aerobic meaning that the plants can have very good oxygen transfer of water, minerals, and nutrients. The beauty of doing that is the fact that when you have heavy rains, it's not gonna get washed away. The charcoal and the pottery stay behind. Even if the water is a complete deluge for days, if not weeks on end, the charcoal and the pottery remain and they don't get washed out. This is a permanent soil amendment. And as the roots of these tomatoes and chives and later other plants that get planted in here, reach down into that soil, they touch that charcoal and they're able to access it because of the fungal network that is growing through the charcoal. You have an entire ecology happening in the ground beneath your feet. It is an amazing system that works very, very well, especially when you have dense clay or dense sand. Putting these kinds of things, biochar, which is the more common term nowadays for it, pot sherds, and in general, terra preta technology. You look how dark this soil is compared to the soil around it. The soil around here has kind of a khaki color because it's clay soil, but right here it's dark. It's black soil, which is where the name terra preta originates from the Portuguese words terra preta del indios, the Indian's black soil or the black soil of the Indians. So this is a very amazing ancient system that works today. It is sustainable. This is, in my opinion, the original permaculture. There's a lot of ways to make compost tea. Compost tea is a great way to use small amounts of compost to get a lot of things covered. For example, in this barrel here, we have about a five pound sack, maybe even less of compost from last year. Now that five pounds wouldn't go very far in my garden, but this barrel of liquid here, that's just water and molasses being aerated around that compost. Well, now we have what's called compost tea. Now I like using aerobic action for compost tea. That is using forced air through these hoses with an air stone from an air pump. Similar thing that you would see in a hydroponic garden or inside of an aquarium. Uh, I like to use this because that reduces the risk of anaerobic bacteria becoming the dominant bacteria in this liquid. 
What else can you throw in here? We can throw wood ash from the fire, uh, from our fires, our campfires. We can throw wood ash in here, which can be very high in potassium. We can throw fresh compost. We can throw in old compost. You can use just leafy greens, and you're going to have to leave it a little bit longer to let them rot in here with the aerobic action. So this is an extremely efficient way and cost-effective way to compost and fertilize your entire garden. And let's just go water some stuff.